Welcome back to This Old Nerd. I'm Aya Zaktar. I am This Old Nerd. Now, we got a lot of feedback on our first episode, which was about wired home networking. So, here's what I want to do. I would like to have you folks go to the blog, go to thisoldnerd.com, and put in some more comments. If you have questions or suggestions, let me know. I'm going to do a follow-up episode where I cover, well, more wired home networking stuff. But I also got some emails from some of you who said, I'm actually going to put in wired networking in my house now, thanks to your show. This is exactly what I wanted this show to do. You guys should totally do this. I love it. Keep up the feedback. Make your house tech forward. I love it. Now, now that you've got your gigabit network in your house, well, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to have like an instant message party? Oh, how's it going in the other room? Great. It's not an intercom, okay? You have gigabit for a reason. Today, we're going to show you the great reason. The home media server. This is the one location where you have all your music, all your pictures, all your videos that can be accessed all over the house, maybe even on the internet. We'll show you that in a later episode. But every single room can access all the same stuff. Plus, it's all in one location. So you only have to back up one thing. So first, we're going to cover how to get your data into the box. Then we're going to talk about the box, the hard drive, and then we're going to talk about the most important thing, the front end. Now, the front end is where your partner will actually be able to access the videos and music and everything else. If that part fails, the partner acceptance rating, all is lost and everything is for naught. And we're not going to let that happen here on This Old Nerd. So come on. Here's what you're going to need for this project. Your DVDs and your media. You're going to need a computer. You might need some extra hard drives because of all the media you have, and you're going to need a boatload of time. All right, so let's say you got a bunch of these guys. You got some dogs, you're taking tons of pictures of these guys, and you're like, well, what do I do with the photos? Now, I highly suggest actually managing them yourself. Use your own file folders and subfolders. So we have a folder for dogs, and we go ahead and maybe put the years in after that. Maybe you want to have years, and then you go ahead and put in subfolders for categories and events. Now, the reason I go with manual management is because it works cross-platform. It always works cross-platform. You're not worried about that stuff. If you want to be able to view your images in a nice piece of software, I highly suggest something like Picasa. Now, what Picasa lets you do is visually inspect your photos, maybe tweak them if you want. Plus, Picasa actually respects the way your file folder structure is set up. So that allows you to do is have your own structure and you have a library tool that will help you. I don't recommend something like iPhoto because iPhoto wants its own structure. If you're willing to give up a lot of control, use something like iPhoto. When it comes to your audio collection, you've got to make a decision. And it's really dependent on how do you listen to your music. If you have audiophile grade speakers or like reference monitoring headphones and you want to hear every note that was intended on your CD, that's right, I said CD. If you're old like me, you might have a bunch of CDs, and how else do you get your Beatles collection on your computer anyway, legally? Uh, you want to rip your audio at lossless quality. There's a lot of different options out there. There's Apple lossless, there's WAV format, there's AFE, there's FLAC. Pick a format that you like and that you are comfortable with. If you need to do research on that, go ahead. Maybe we'll even cover it in a future episode. However, if you really don't care about your music and you're using something like this, this is the iPod headset you obviously don't care about your music and the quality of your audio. So I suggest ripping your audio at a lower quality, maybe 256 kilobits per second, maybe 320, maybe one of these higher things, and iTunes and Windows Media Player actually have settings for this, so you can adjust your bit rate. Uh, when you eventually decide that this is no longer good enough, you'll still be able to hear better quality. The fact is, if you take poor audio, so you have like a 64 kilobits per second audio clip, and you play it on the best speakers, it's going to sound like garbage, and you're not going to want to do that. Not garbage the band. They're very good. I like to have two sets of stuff. I like to have super high quality for my favorite songs, and not so high quality for stuff like sound effects. We've talked about your images. We've talked about your music. Now we're going to be talking about the bulk of your home media server, at least if you're like me, your DVDs, Blu-ray, and every other video you have. So here we're at our Mac Pro. We've got our DVD. We're going to put it in our DVD drive. And if you've got a Mac, you've got pretty much one option when it comes to ripping software. We have Mac the Ripper. If you're on Windows, you can get DVD Shrink, DVD Decryptor, any DVD. There's a lot of uh, free options on Windows and a lot of pay options on Mac. Only one free option on the Mac called Mac the Ripper. You can find them, just do a Google search. So when you rip the DVD, you're going to end up with 
a folder, actually two folders, a video TS folder and an audio TS folder. For your video TS folder, you're gonna see a BUP file, which I don't know what it's for, but these are your videos, VOB files. Now, what you do is, if you have a DVD, you take the video TS folder, you drag it to your DVD player software, and it'll play the actual file. So what you're going to have, your experience is going to be a full DVD experience. So you're gonna have the menus, and you have audio track selections, and you have everything you'd expect from a real DVD. The problem with this is, DVDs are freaking big. They're about seven to nine gigabytes large, unless you have an older movie. But for the most part, they're around nine gigabytes large per movie. So now, what you're probably gonna to wanna to do is decide, how do you watch your movies? Same thing like I said with the audio. If you like the exact experience that you have with the DVD, stick to this video TS format. However, if you wanna actually be able to move these things around or put it on a portable device, you're going to want to do one more step. So I suggest for every single DVD that you rip, create a portable version. I use Handbrake to create MP4s. You can make a DivX copy, XBID. It's completely up to you. Just make sure it works with your portable device. All right, so we're finally here. We're at a home media server. Actually, the server part is this Mac Mini. I don't know if you can see it above my head. It's an old Intel-based Mac Mini, so it's not super fast but it'll do the job. You don't need a super fast computer to be the server. Uh, you might want a super fast computer when you're ripping DVDs and encoding them, but not necessarily as your server. I'm gonna show you my old server, and you see that iBook attached to all those external hard drives? Yeah, that's what I used to have. When I first started, I had an external hard drive, and then I got another, and another, and another, and another, until I had this giant monstrosity. Now all of that has been replaced by this guy. This is the Drobo. Can we get a close up of the Drobo? This little box is the answer to a lot of problems. Now I'm gonna rip off the face because I'm a violent guy. It's just magnetic. What you have here is very RAID-like. You have four hard drives. These are all the same size, but they could be varying. And what this device does is it backs itself up constantly. So there may be six terabytes of actual hard drive space here, because these are each one and a half terabytes, but we only have four usable. That's because Drobo backs up at least one drive. So if this drive here fails, if I rip this out right now and I could, but I'm not going to, Drobo would rebuild the entire contents of that drive. So all the time that you put in ripping DVDs and your music and your pictures, they're all backed up within this box. Now Drobo isn't paying us a dime, they should be, but this is one of my favorite toys. Now, why would I tell you to buy a Drobo over building your own RAID or just creating the biggest, nastiest NAS box you've ever had? Here's why. If you're like me, if you are an old nerd, you have a lot of other things to do in your real life. So to worry about backing up your stuff or setting up a RAID properly or having to have the exact style of hard drive, like four or five of them in a row, versus the Drobo, which does all the backing up for you, plus you can use any variety of disks it's just a no-brainer at a certain point. You have real-life stuff to do. This is why I suggest the Drobo. If you've got a lot of time, totally go out and make your own raid. I would love to see that happen, but myself, I just don't have the time for that anymore. Odds are, if you're watching this show, This Old Nerd, you probably don't need the following information. If you don't know how to share your network resource, so the thing you want to share around the network, uh, you should do a quick Google search. I'll give you a quick kind of glossy overview right now. If you're in Windows, go to Control Panel, make sure you have file sharing on, then pick the folder that has all your videos and share that folder. It should be accessible by anybody. If you're on OS X, go into Sharing and turn that on, and that's in System Preferences, and then find the folder you have and share that too. You can test this out pretty easily by using another machine. If it doesn't work, I'm sure you'll find a way to do it. All right, so you've finally ripped all your DVDs, you've taken all your movies, you have this one giant collection. How are you gonna access that? Are you gonna use the standard Mac OS X interface? Or are you gonna use the standard Windows 7 interface? No, and here's why. Your partner is going to say, guess what? Not happening. I'm not using a keyboard and mouse in my living room, okay? This is the living room. We have a giant TV. I wanna use a menu system, so, Again, if you make technology to the point where you hear this. It's not working. That's bad. Here's what you want to hear. Wow, this is so much easier. See what I'm saying? Now, what we're going to use is front end software. On our Mac here, we have something called Plex. 
Now Plex is based off the Xbox Media Center project. If you're a nerd like me, you know what that is. If you don't know what it is, check out Wikipedia. It also goes by XBMC. Now Plex just came out with a brand new version that does a lot of things for you. So you tell Plex, hey, I have all these folders. Could you go check it out? Plex goes ahead and finds what you have, gets all the metadata for the movies. So it's gonna tell you the director, the genre, the stars, everything you can think of all in one place. So if you go to Plex, you go, I don't know what I wanna watch in my three terabyte library. Why don't I check by genre? It's found everything for you. So that's pretty cool. There's also Boxy. Now Boxy is also an offshoot of the Xbox Media Center. It doesn't handle video TS folders too well. It doesn't handle those Bob files too well. You might just end up watching one part of your full movie. But if you built a library of MP4s or something, Boxy is very good. Plus, if you want a lot of digital streaming content, like from Netflix or from Rev3 or maybe even this show one day, this is a very good solution. That's Boxy. It's also on Windows and Mac, so it's pretty neat. And by the way, so far, these pieces of software are free. There is one other Apple alternative. It's the Apple Front Row software. Now, it's kind of like Media Center on Windows, except it doesn't do DVR functionality. It's kind of severely limited. But you know what? In all fairness, it does handle DVDs okay. And it does play MP4s pretty well. Just don't throw a lot of non-Apple approved standard codecs at it. Okay, because it might not handle it too well. So we're at our Windows box and we're using Windows Media Center. If you have Windows 7, Microsoft has built in an application called Media Center. Now it used to be a whole separate distribution of XP, but now it's built into every copy of 7. So what does it look like? Let's go ahead and show it to you. You can see you have a list for your pictures and videos, your music, you see what's playing right now with the Beatles anthology, your movies. Now notice movies and videos are separate. Videos for some reason, are not DVDs and movies are DVDs. So if you try to access a VOB file in the video section, it's going to fail. You go ahead and you go into your settings and you go into your media libraries. This is how you link your Windows Media Center to your network share. So you go, okay, well you can't have playback during this time, that's fine. You tell, okay, my music, you can pick, you can add folders to the library. It's pretty simple, if you understand basic networking, and I know you do since you watch the show, you can say on another computer, and then it's actually going to look for things on your network. If you have your sharing settings set right, you'll be able to find your Drobo. For our example, our computer is called Bender, and our videos are shared on Drobo. So we can go ahead and select that, and it's going to include all the subfolders and search for that. Now, Windows Media Center doesn't actually build its own metadata library. It doesn't actually go out and find information about if your video is a comedy or if it's from 1994 or whatever, but you can get a plugin called My Movies. It's a free plugin and this is what it looks like. This is My Movies. As you can see, we have a ton of movies available. You can see we have AbFab, we have Adventureland, all these fun things, and all the movie posters are there. So with this plugin, you get a piece of software and you tell it where your network share is. It goes in and finds out what you have. So if you've named your things non-cryptically, like we have, we've actually called this is American History X. So our folder says American History X. My movies will actually put metadata in those folders and you will get your movie poster and all this other information if you want to sort it by genre or whatever. So we're going to go to the sort function. We're going to say by runtime. I feel like a particularly long movie. This one says 75 minutes, 78. As we move to the right, you can see the movies are getting long. Eventually we'll reach the three hour apocalypse now. But the main point is, it's doing all the work for you and actually did it quite fast. Now one of the weird things about my movies is it doesn't necessarily handle TV seasons that well. What happens is you tell it, I want to watch The Simpsons season 12 and it's like, do you want to watch disc one, two, or three, or four? According to my movies, it thinks that each disc is its own season. It's kind of got some weirdness going on. So what I'm suggesting to you is if your partner wants to watch a television program, grab the remote. So let's recap what we did. We took all our media, our music, our pictures, our movies, everything, now on a hard drive. That hard drive is now accessible throughout our home network. We can watch anything, listen to anything, see anything. What do we do now? Sit down, take a break. That's why we did all this. We can sit on our butts and watch a movie. You know what? I think that's gonna wrap up this episode, actually. Next week, we'll have a brand new exciting project. And you know what? 
remember to ask yourself this. How is your tech life? I think I'm going to go watch a movie now myself. Wow, this is so much easier. You're a genius.